Are you ready to start, Ray? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, right then, ladies and gentlemen, it's seven o'clock. So, welcome to this meeting of the Audit and Risk Committee. Uh, and the bit echo, isn't it? And the, the first task is the apologies. Hey, apologies, Chair, I've received from Councillors uh, McCartney, Councillors, I think it's on your sheet there. I've got it in my head. Councillor Baines and Councillor Fox, and obviously Councillor Ainsley is here in place of Councillor Fox. Um, I've not heard from Councillor Blanksby or Councillor Cross, but I know it's lambing for Councillor Cross, so they're the ones the ones I've received anyway. Thank you for that. Uh, to confirm the minutes of the Audit and Risk Committee held on the 6th of December 2022, I'll propose it and I'll approve it because you weren't here. Are there any declarations of interest? No. Any petitions, deputations or questions? None received, Chair. Any questions with notice from members? None received. Any notices of motions? None received either. All right, so we'll move on to the substantive items. And the first one is the update on the statement of accounts. Could I remind everyone still to use the microphones and to switch them off afterwards as this is being broadcast? Thank you. Uh, good evening, all. Um, so I'll just make quick introductions as well. Um, so I'm Kirsty Nutton, the new Section 151 officer for Rutland County Council. So my first audit committee, and unfortunately, the, my first report is about the delay in the statement of accounts for 2122. Um, and as it's noted in the report, so this has been an issue throughout the year. We've, we've missed the We've missed the first deadline and we were hoping to bring the accounts to this audit committee, but as was sometimes the case when accounts remain open for a period, new information comes to light that we need to take account of, literally account of in, in, our, in our accounts. Um, so up until this point and, um, and the report details that there has been delays um, with the ink for us, um, evaluations of our assets have caused some delays to the audit. Um, and more recently, there are some national issues also affecting council's audits. So this is common uh, across, across the country. One is infrastructure assets. Um, and the other one, which has come to, to light more recently, is the valuation of our pension fund due to more accurate information being available. So we use estimates in our accounts and therefore we have to revisit this particular occasion uh, for the more accurate information on the pension fund and of course that's linked to Leicestershire as well so we've got some other third parties involved. Um, due to the delay we need to work with the auditors about resolving some of these issues and having a concrete timescales involved and a plan of action to deliver our accounts so we'll be working with the auditors on that but with regards to the pension fund we need a bit more information before um, we can get some more concrete plans. That's a brief overview. I don't know if Andrew, you'd like to add anything. As Andrew knows a bit more, he's been closer to it for longer as well. So, no, Kirsty, I think your your summary gives us up to an updated position in terms of where we're at on the pension fund. One of the things I would add is the reason why it's such a big concern for our for our accounts is that we've been less to share of indicated that the difference on our accounts could be between five and 10% of our pension fund liability. And for Rutland, that'd be between two and 4 million. So that's well above our materiality in our accounts, which is just above a million. So we would have to make changes for our accounts for those types of numbers. We can't just say we'll adjust them in future periods. <clears throat> so that's why we have to delay for an outcome from audit. We can't just press ahead in terms of, you know, why can't we just bring the accounts to this committee to sign off? because we know the auditors wouldn't be able to issue their opinion on our accounts. Right. Well, first off, the 5 to 10 percent, it's not a small figure. If you said 1 to 2 percent, I could, but 5 to 10 percent, 2 to 4 million. Could you be a, put a bit more flesh on the bones as to why this discrepancy? Yeah, I can. There's a number of, this, there's a number of things that have happened that have led to that figure. It's not just, so there's return on investment. So 
pension funds have quite complex investment portfolios. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason is that we've just gone, pension funds go through triannual valuations and every three years they get revalued. This year was the first year of the triannual revaluation and those assumptions now are known better. So the results of that trial and triannual valuation are known and they can feed into things like life expectancy, changes all of those. They've got far greater detail on the on the results of the triangle valuation that would impact it. So it's it's almost been like the perfect storm in terms of why that figure is a lot higher than what it might normally be and why the estimates were so wrong. So is it fair to say there's been a bit of over-egging of the pudding in the last couple of years and now it's uh, coming to home to us to see the reality? I, I wouldn't say that. I'm, pension funds are extremely complex things to estimate on and five to seven percent does sound a large number but they're extremely complex things to get right and in reality we'll never know the answer until those liabilities are, are born on the council so i wouldn't say we've over egged it we've done estimates based on where we're at when you think of the turbulence there's been in the economy as well and you overlay that with the pension fund it's it's been an incredibly difficult time to try and estimate anything to do with return on investments, life expectancy, inflation, all of those things put together in a big pot just meant that it was, it handed the delays to the accounts, meant that we're in a position where there is a big number. It could be smaller than that number for, for Rutland. The impact could be smaller. That's just the, the initial estimate that we've been given on Leicestershire. They're a lot closer to the figures. Their impact was between 5 and 10%. So that's where that figure's come from for Rutland. It could be less, it could be more. Until we see the numbers and get the report, we won't know. Now, I can accept that it's been very difficult times in the markets and generally last couple of years. I won't go into the reasons why. Um, how long before you're in a position to actually give us a definitive answer? And there's a... There's a, num there's a number of different things that are at play with this one. We're waiting for our auditors to advise us on their approach to it and what they'd expect us to do based on the new information. And secondly, because um, this isn't an issue that the pension fund have seen before, they, um, they don't have the report set up to be able to give us a revised report. So the pension fund actuaries will have to write a whole new report and whole new, set up a whole new process to give us the information we need to update the valuations. They can't just take our existing report and say, produce a new one now with this information. That's not how they can do it is what I've been told. So it is a, it's a big process that they're going to have to go through and do. It will be a, potentially at a cost to the council as well because we've, we'll have to bear the cost of them doing the work. Um, and the other side of it, because it's a national issue, if it is going to be cost effective, then how do the, the bodies like SITFA play into it and the government play into it in terms of letting us hang over with our accounts being so far out of date as well? Is there there's a role for them to play in terms of how they want to manage that as well? So I don't have a definitive timescale that I can commit to at the minute. What I would say is as a council, we're, we're geared up to make the changes when they need to so we can bring the accounts as soon as possible here. Our working papers are all set up. So when we've got the revised report, we can be speedy in terms of turnaround times to get it to this committee. But I can't tell you what committee this would be able to come to until a lot of those issues are all resolved. I accept all of that. But what I'm hearing is I can't give you an answer. I can't give you the definitive answer. I haven't got a date. I hear the sound of the ball rolling down the road. And, and that is not a sound that I'm unused to when it comes to dealing with certain issues like this. We, we need to be careful here. We need, I'm a great believer in deadlines because even if you miss them, at least it galvanizes your activities in some, in the direction. So I'd just like to say to you, I accept everything you've said. I don't doubt your integrity, but from my side, sitting here, it's not a tune that I'm enjoying. Okay. Paul, let's, let's bring Paul in first. Thanks, Chair. I guess what the, what the situation is, the triennial review is obviously is based at the date at the end of the 31st of March 2022. So you're looking, what, almost a year behind since? It's taken most of that year for the actuaries to come up with this triennial review. It's 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 a 
very detailed piece of work where they go through the estimates in great detail to come up with where they think the actual standing of the whole pension fund is. What you get in the inter interim periods is a few assumptions that change the value going forward and rolling it forward for the three years. If you wanted to do a full revaluation every year, well, they wouldn't be, they would be just doing the draft accounts going back here. So there's a, it's kind of a, the, there's an interim process that goes on. I think this time is it's quite a unique circumstance that we're actually in this case with a lot of with a lot of authorities where they haven't got the 21, 22 accounts signed off and the triennial review results are being published and they're seeing what the actual valuations are. And um, what's going on in the audit world at the moment is that all of the audit suppliers are meeting with the FRC and the NAO to discuss this, to come up with a consensus, because there's no point one audit firm deciding on one thing and another audit firm deciding on another. We want a consistent approach so that every, nobody's impacted because obviously there is a cost implication in this and those discussions are currently ongoing through through a technical panel called TechNet. Um, so at the moment, we don't have an answer of which way it's going to go. Um, we're waiting to see what the consensus is, is that comes out of that. But I think... We just want to know what's going on and we want to make a decision that's practical um, and obviously at the FRC and the NAO have a view on that and we'll take our lead from there and obviously sit for involved as well. So it's, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's a bit like the infrastructure assets issue that's kind of cropped up, there needs to be a national census unfortunately, it's just the timing of it and it's the catching of the authorities that haven't signed off and in a lot of cases, most of the ones that had infrastructure assets haven't had their accounts signed. So it's kind of just an unfortunate that it's come straight after that. Let's let Paul yes, come in. Thank you. Um, new to the committee, standing in. So please forgive me if this is a totally naive question. But um, I'm really concerned that with such a large discrepancy, five to 10 percent, and actually we're not able to see what's happened in 22, 23 and 23, 24 is still coming what is the solvency of the current practice are people going to be missing out on their pensions are we certain that there's no that our pension holders are in fact protected so the training review is a snapshot in time um obviously the the liabilities are normally assumed to unwind over 40 years so you're looking at the liability for the next 40 years and as people are, as people retire they move out and start taking their pension new people join the pension scheme and start contributing the local government pension schemes are get backed by the government so there is no insolvency unlike a private one they're fully funded so if they unwound now all the liabilities would be met by the government what they do is they separate them out into regional pension schemes just for the administration so there's not one great big local government pension scheme well, I'm glad to hear that the government are protecting the pensions, but it doesn't help me much, to be honest, to be told that actually it's a national scheme which is now being rolled up regionally because that's easier to administer. So um, you, we're absolutely confident, are we, that we have no liabilities that we're unable to meet within the pension fund? 100% confident. I can never be 100% confident based on... <laughs> I would I would say based on our current position and the figures we've about got in hand, even if it increased by the number that we're talking about, the five to ten percent, the council would still have a positive position on its balance sheet. So we would still have enough reserves to to meet any future liabilities. Obviously, if it does come and those are realised, like Paul said, these are not realised tomorrow. So we're never going to have to pay this forty million pound back tomorrow. It's, it goes up and down every year. So if you look back in our accounts two years two years ago, we would have had a negative position on our balance sheet, mainly because of the pension fund liabilities shut up and then they've evened out. So the pension fund goes up and down every year. And this is a similar position to this. So am I confident we would, would be able to be still be solvent if we met all of our pension liabilities? I am in the short term. I can't predict what's going to happen in 40 years' time. Thank you. And just... But somebody who's a total amateur. Short term, how long? Sorry, short term, as in 
how long it's a short term i got 40 years for the liabilities and the short term is what three to five you'd be confident yeah i, I would certainly in the current triannual review process we we know what that's going to be we know the figures where they're going to be roughly the assumptions won't change there will be like paul said minor updates so in certainly the next three years i would say even beyond that into 10 to 15 years we know that we're not going to be drawing down liabilities but if something happened and legislation changes i i can't predict what's going to happen out there so another pandemic another more wars i can't predict that the council's going to be there but if everything stayed the same i'm confident that the council would still be solvent in 10 years time Thank you. My primary concern was quite simply that we haven't seen anything for 22, 23. We've got another year where we're not going to see anything. So I just wanted to make sure that we were confident that we we're actually going to meet our liabilities and that the pension fund was largely sold. I don't expect you to be able to forecast 20 years in advance. That's not the game we're in. But at the moment, we have to meet liabilities. And it's please, I'm pleased to hear that we are protected. So thank you. I think, I think the director might want to come in here. Yeah, I was just going to add as part of the triannual valuation as well, it looks at the rate that we contribute into the pension fund as well. And that's what we build our medium term financial strategy on. So and that's what fixes it for three years. Sometimes I've seen pension funds where actually the rate continues and rolls on for longer. So we get some stability and we get that assurance that we will be able to meet those liabilities based on that rate as well. So. Yeah. Thank you very much for your patience. So we know we don't have a time scale. Do, do we have a time scale that we can rule out? And I'm thinking here of May the 5th. Are we not going to be ready for the members of this committee, or albeit there's only two of us here who are sitting members, uh, to actually see this before the 5th of May? You can go first. <laughs> I let Paul speak. I was going to say, I think it's highly unlikely. I think is the answer. If if it can be done, then we will. But it, because it's a national issue, I have a feeling it won't be resolved that quickly. And I have a feeling it's the devil and deep blue sea because I'm not sure I'd want to sign them off in Perda anyway, or there's no reason not to, I don't think, because it's not a new policy or anything. Uh, but those who are going to be here, Hopefully next year you, you might want to bear in mind who you put onto this panel. Uh, is there anything else, members? I just got to say it just sounds awfully vague, Chair. I accept everything, all the caveats, all the possibilities, but it does sound desperately vague. Uh, very quick, I'm sorry. Yeah, Karen um, first. I think what um, Andrew is saying is that it, it, it's a national problem and we're ready to go when we get the answers. Um, and I think the auditors are also very on board with all the problems as well. So as soon as we get the answers, we're ready. If I may just briefly, I, I don't know whether to take comfort in the fact that it's a national issue or <clears throat> because... Uh, we all, well, I, I won't become a doomster, but should I take comfort from the fact that it's a national issue and not a local issue? We're not the only ones in this position, not by a long way. <laughs> that might be good. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yes, Andrew. What I will say is that I will keep all members updated as part of the process through the members, through the weekly member, like every two weekly members briefing. So do look out for that. I will, as soon as we know a time scale or there's updates that we can give, I will provide updates on the 2122 accounts as they come through through that process. So do it there. And if you do have any queries or questions, you can come to me as well. Happy to take them. That would be very helpful. If in the unlikely event, it looks like it's going to come before May the 5th, we'll no doubt take advice from the monitoring officer what to do. Yeah. Right, if we're done with that, um, I'm guessing it's Rachel with the internal audit update. Thank you, Chair. So the first report this evening is in relation to the delivery of this current year's internal audit plan. Uh, so the report's in the usual format, but I'll take members through the key sections. So the report's provided in full as Appendix A to your papers this evening from page 13. Uh, so all of the audits within your internal audit plan are either complete or in progress. 
So we remain on track to deliver your plan for the year and deliver your internal audit annual opinion and uh, report for the next meeting of this committee. So at the time of producing this report, we had finalised further reports in relation to the housing benefit system, performance management, safety recruitment in schools and children missing from care. So of a mixture of different assurance areas there. All of those received an opinion of satisfactory assurance or above, and they're reflected in the in full in the table um, from page 16 of your papers, uh, where obviously this sets out all of the audits within this year's internal audit plan. The status of the assignments as at the time of producing this report for the committee and the outcomes of those that had been finalised at the time of reporting. So as members will see, there are a number that were either fieldwork complete or draft report at the time of producing this report. So those have all moved forward since then. We've also completed field work on a number of other audits as well. And um, so we're in a, in a good place in terms of delivery of the plan. Um, I think the only one to mention that I have noted as a, an area of delay on the audit plan was in relation to the highways maintenance contract. We have had some delays in getting the information through. So that's the only one where I foresee we may not finalise it by the end of March, but we'll do everything we can as soon as that information comes through to, to finalise it. And it will be, as I say, ready for the annual internal audit report and opinion. And also within the report is an update on the implementation of audit recommendations from the audit. So there's a the usual table as Appendix C on page 28, which shows we have marked six actions as closed since the last audit committee meeting. Uh, we currently have 14 actions which are overdue, but only one of them falls into the category of being high priority and over three months overdue. So this is one where we try to draw attention to uh, the committee in relation to any of those actions. So on that basis, you do have full details in Appendix D on page 29 of the papers. So you've got full details on the action, the status as at the time of producing this report, and the revised date for implementation that's been set by officers as well. We've also provided you with the latest of our rolling risk reviews. So obviously members of the committee saw the first one of these at the last meeting. Uh, so the next review that we did was in relation to the risk of failure to achieve expectations of customers. Uh, so we've set that out and our findings from page 21 of the papers this evening. So we've not identified any areas, we've not made any recommendations around the actions that are noted on the risk register. So just to remind the committee what we're essentially doing here, we're not conducting a full audit, but what we want to do is give you a bit of a real time assurance that the actions and the controls that are listed on your strategic risk register are actually there or are being progressed in line with what's um, on the risk register entry. So that's what we've worked through here. So we work through each of the key controls that's listed on the strategic risk register, give each a RAG rating of red, amber or green, depending on our findings. And we've given you a little bit of assurance as well in the final column about what our assurance has been based on. And as I say, there were no areas of red or amber in relation to this. So the list, we were able to confirm that the controls that were listed on your strategic risk register were there or were evidenced. And um, we were able to give that assurance. So that's also incorporating the within the papers. So just to note, obviously the, anything that hasn't been finalized as at the time of producing this report will be uh, fed back to members as part of the annual internal audit report. So you will obviously see the outcomes of all of these in due course. So I think that's a quick run through chair, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Right, just an observation. It's a very comprehensive report. I congratulate you on that. It's very nice, heartening to see that it's all greens all the way. Um, no, as you say, no ambers or reds. So that's that's good. That 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 suggests a lot of people are working hard and are on where they need to be. So yes, I'm 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 impressed with it. Thank you. I'd just like to echo those sentiments. I thought it was a very good report. It's really good to see so many greens. Not always usual, is it? But very good to see it. So yes, congratulations on all the hard work that's been done. Thank you. I'd be pleased to hear I have no questions. Wow. <laughs> uh, so we can move on to the audit plan. Okay, thank you, Chair. So my next report is looking ahead to the new financial year as we um, come towards the 1st of April. We obviously want to get this plan in place ready for us to deliver for you um, for the new financial year. So I did consult the committee at a previous meeting on the audit plan development process and um, any areas that needed to be fed into that that the committee wanted to raise. 
So obviously I've gone away and followed that process as we agreed at that meeting and developed the draft audit plan on that basis. So the report that I'm bringing to you today that starts at this Appendix A on page 37 of the papers, the, the start of the report really sets out the process that we went through into making sure that we have a modern risk-based internal audit plan uh, that's designed to add value um, in the management of your risks, give you assurance around value for money, but also fraud risks and internal control and governance risk management controls as well. So essentially, we've focused on your risk registers. I've consulted with all of your senior leadership team to make sure that I'm addressing the areas of their concern or risk for the for the 12 months ahead. Um, fed that into the process, looked at other sources of assurance as well. So if there's already some sources of assurance available, it's not the best use of our time to be focusing in those areas. So we obviously take that into consideration as well. Uh, we've also looked at things like performance reporting and our general horizon scanning around changes in legislation, changes in regulations that could pose some, some risk to us as well in the year ahead. So crucially, the draft internal audit plan is on page 41 to 43 of your papers. Uh, I don't intend to go through it line by line. Obviously, I've, I've provided for each of the assignments a slight, a small overview of, of the assurance that we'll be looking to gather from that piece of work. I've also tried to link to your risk register or the source of that uh, particular piece of work, if, if relevant, and give you an indication of the timing for most of those assignments as well, uh, where we've already set the, the agreed timing and the scope for those. So just to highlight a few of them, obviously we've got some big areas in terms of strategic risk, cybersecurity features on the audit plan. I think that's a top risk for most local authorities, if not all organizations. So I think that's good to have that as a regular review. We've obviously got the usual financial systems audits that we do on a cyclical basis. We are proposing to continue with your rolling risk reviews like the one that I presented to you this evening and to continue to give that real time assurance over the controls that are in the risk register. Some of the specific areas that we've got on page 42, look at some of the areas such as safeguarding related areas, looking at things like the new regulations that will be coming in in the next year. Um, for example, we have private sector housing enforcement. We are expecting some changes in regulations around private sector housing enforcement um, for the housing health and safety rating system for damp and mould, for example. So we've factored that into the internal audit plan as an area that we need to make sure we're up to speed with. And um, we've also looked at things like adult social care data quality, because we're mindful that over the next year, that will be a focus for the CQC when they're looking at where they need to focus their new inspections. They will be relying on the data that's readily available. So we want to make sure that that's, that's up to scratch, full and complete um, to inform that work. Um, we've also um, included uh, the local plan development project as, a, as one of your key areas, uh, an area to give the committee assurance over the management of that key project over the, the next 12 months. And obviously another key area, another key contract um, procurement process around highways maintenance as well. So obviously for this year, this current year, we're looking at the actual management of the existing contract. Next year, we will be focusing our attention more on looking towards the future of procuring a fit for purpose value for money contract going forward. Just the other, only other area I was going to mention was that on page 43, we have 15 days set aside for advisory support on the transformation program. What I'm looking for the internal audit team to deliver there really is to be available throughout the year as needed as this transformation work unfolds. Just to look at if we are changing a process to make some efficiencies, if we're looking to do things in a different way, let's have some independent assurance from internal audit that we're happy we're not stripping out some key controls that could present a risk further down the line. So this would be ad hoc advisory work rather than an audit as such. So there wouldn't be an audit opinion brought to the committee on that. But it just means that we're readily available as a bit of a critical friend during that process. So just to mention that, obviously, we've noted that as advisory support for that reason. And um, so that's a run through of the plan. Also provided as Appendix B is the internal audit charter. So this is an annual a document that I bring to you on an annual basis um, for review and approval by the committee in line with the public sector internal audit standards. Um, I like to bring it alongside the internal audit plan for the year because it essentially sets out this is what we'll be delivering for you and this is how we will be delivering it in relation to the charter. So as I say, it is in line with the public sector internal audit standards. There's not a lot of wiggle room really as to what we can, how we can deliver internal audit. So it's pretty much aligned with the standards, but it sets out how specifically for Rutland County Council, we deliver that service to make sure we're aligned with the standards in line with ethical standards as well. 
and, um, and the quality that we would expect in terms of the audit service. So I haven't proposed any significant changes to the ways that we will be delivering the audit service in terms of the charter content. The only amendment I wanted to draw the committee's attention to is an amendment to the assurance rating. So members of the committee will be familiar with our existing assurance opinions, which the mid-range assurance opinion being currently satisfactory assurance. Now I inherited these assurance opinions and I've always been very uncomfortable with the term satisfactory assurance because it is essentially the mid-range amber out of our RAG rated um, assurance opinions. So I always feel there's almost a motive or there's an interpretation of the word satisfactory that could be taken to be sufficient or acceptable without further action. When actually, if we're giving that mid-range assurance, it's not okay, there is work that needs to be done. So for that reason, I've suggested changing what was satisfactory assurance as the middle range to moderate assurance, because I don't think the same thing can be read into moderate as, as satisfactory. Um, so on page uh, 60 of your papers, you'll see the revised assurance opinions, which go from substantial, good, moderate, limited, and no assurance for both the control environment and the compliance opinions. I've also refreshed the definitions on all of them as well, just to make them a little bit clearer, I think, about what we actually mean by the assurance opinions, um, and also to align it with the risk management framework as well, to make sure that we're consistent in our terminology. The only other amendment is in relation to our organisational impact opinion. So members may recall that in relation to this, this is looking at the, the impact of the findings on the organisation as a whole to give some context to the findings. So in the past, these have been either major, moderate or minor. Um, I'm proposing changing these to high, medium and low just because they're more standard, they're more aligned with your risk management framework. And I think they, they're more meaningful to people. So that's the only other amendment as well. Um, so they, as I say, those are on page 60 of the papers. So overall, the audit plan is brought to the committee today for formal review and approval. And if signed off, we'll obviously make a start in April. Um, and be reporting back to the committee on the, on progress. And the internal audit charter is also brought to you for your formal annual approval as well. Um, uh, there is an additional recommendation, recommendation three on the covering report, just to note as well, that we are recommending that delegated authority be given to your section 151 officer in consultation with the chair of this committee to agree any amendments to the audit plan during the year. And we always recommend this on an annual basis when we bring the plan because it, the way that we work to deliver a, a valuable internal audit service that's reactive and responsive to changes in the risk environment, we need to be able to respond to that during the year and not have to wait for the next audit committee to make an amendment. So for that reason, we've included as recommendation three that delegation. So hopefully that's a, a run through of the key parts of the report. But again, I'm happy to take questions on the plan or the charter or uh, any elements of the report. Thank you. Anybody, right. I'll make a couple of observations. I've got a background with uh, SEND, and a green paper fills me with dread. And, and there's been conflicting movements in SEND over the last 20 years. One, in one paper, it's something's in, and another paper, something's out. So I, I suspect there will be some hidden costs coming through there. There always is, because somebody's got a new bee in his bonnet and wants to try it out. Uh, so I warn about that because it's almost always a case that SEND ends up struggling to find the money to cover the needs that it does. Similarly, when you look at adult care and health funding, all these are posturing, or these are all uh, areas where expenditure is never going to go down. You can, it's only going to go one way and it's going to go up. And so, again, I know you all know this, but these there will be some devil in the detail when this comes along i'm expecting to hear it Oh. yeah there have been significant changes introduced so 
Uh, what the full impact of that green paper will be will be very interesting to see. Actually, I know that this uh, initially it was greeted with a lot of optimism, but what wasn't addressed, of course, was the significant charges or cost changes that are likely to happen. So, we shall keep weather eyeing it, both from the SEN perspective and obviously from the financial perspective, which I'm sure you're much more interested in. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that I welcome the decision on page 43 to commission for regarding the commissioning of leisure services. Um, that was a very public outcry against the initial decision. And I thought the cabinet handled the handled the situation well, given the public outcry. So an invest so a audit to assist with the processes, I think would be exceptionally interesting to see. And I, I look forward to seeing what you bring forward for that. Um, I have thoughts, but they're not for this committee. So We'll we'll see. So other than that, I thought it was a good report. Thank you very much again. This is getting tiresome, isn't it? Really? <laughs> Not at all. I meant that. This. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And I have no questions for you, Ray. So I welcome those changes in terminology. And that makes an awful lot of sense. Yes. Um, so if no one has anything else, this one is slightly different. We are actually going to agree something. So the recommendation is that the committee approves the proposed audit plan allocations for 2023-24, approves the internal audit charter and strategy, and as you've heard, delegates authority for the strategic director of resources in consultation with the chair of audit and risk to agree amendments to the plan during the financial year, if required, and don't worry about that, that is standard and we have had to do it this year. So I'm going to propose that from the chair, could I have a seconder? Could we vote on it, please? It's unanimous. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And we move on to any other business of which I have not been notified. So thank you, Ray, for your service. Thank you, Paul, for turning up. Thank you to... Uh, thank you, everyone, on the other side of the tables and David. And uh, that completes the meeting for today. Thank you. Yes,